explain a lot about the medical benefits of cannabis or the environmental and industrial benefits of growing hemp or really even the harms caused by the, the war on cannabis. What I want to talk about is the struggle to change the law and how I believe we can work together to decriminalize and illegalize cannabis right here in British Columbia within the next few years. Now, I've been working on this campaign. Hey, welcome. I've been working on this campaign for pretty much all of my adult life. As a student, I started a club at my university campus at SFU called the League for Ethical Action on Drugs. After I graduated, I went to work for Mark Emery, the Prince of Pot. He's now sitting in a prison in Yazoo, Mississippi for mailing marijuana seeds to Americans, but really he's there for funding the marijuana movement, being a great activist for, for most of the 90s. And, uh, and while I was working with him, I was editor of Cannabis Culture Magazine for 10 years, and I had a chance to learn a lot about cannabis and the culture and politics and society that surrounds it. I helped create the Canadian Marijuana Party and the BC Marijuana Party, and I ran as a candidate for both of them out here on the Sunshine Coast. And in 2003, I joined the NDP, and I created a group in the NDP called End Prohibition that works to develop better marijuana drug policies in the party. In 2005, I opened the Vancouver Seed Bank, and a few years later, 2008, I opened the Vancouver Medicinal Cannabis Dispensary. We now serve, come on in. We now serve over 4,000 patients from two locations in the Lower Mainland and across the rest of the country by mail order as well. And in 2011, I ran for the leadership of the BC NDP, and uh, here I am today promoting the Sensible BC campaign. And I'll tell you, in all that time, people have often said to me, Dana, what are you getting so worked up about? It's inevitable that marijuana is going to be legalized. It's just a matter of time till the laws change. You don't need to worry about it. It's inevitable that it's going to happen. Nothing could be further from the truth. To make these kind of changes requires a great deal of time and effort and energy and money and sacrifice. All those things have been be put in place in order for us to change these laws. Come on in. Oh, yeah, no worries. And, uh, and I feel in many ways that where we are now is very similar to where we were in the late 1970s. At that time, it seemed like the cannabis laws were just about to change. And in Canada, we had the Conservative Prime Minister Joe Clark and Liberal Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau both saying it was time to change the marijuana laws. In the U.S., President Jimmy Carter was saying the same thing. And many American states were having referendums to decriminalize cannabis possession and move it from a criminal uh, uh, jailing offense to a fine of some sort. Hey, thanks for coming. And, uh, and so, uh, and yet in all that time, all the whole generation has gone by and the laws have not gotten any better. In fact, for the most part, they've actually gotten worse. Now, we have had a lot of victories over the last 20 years when it comes to reforming our, our cannabis. Not so much the laws, but the situation around cannabis in Canada. You know, you, 20 years ago, you couldn't get a bong or a pipe or vaporizers weren't even invented yet, but you couldn't get bongs or pipes or any kind of harm reduction devices like that. If you wanted to smoke cannabis, you had to punch holes in a tin can and make a pipe in that way. And now those things are readily available across the country. Books and information about how to use cannabis safely and grow up properly also weren't available when all of them were banned, but now those books are also widely available across the country. And cannabis seeds are also available, so you can find the right strain to meet your medical needs and get what you, get what you need out of that plant. But aside from the, the legalization of hemp in 1996, where the law actually changed and we were allowed to grow hemp in Canada for the first time, other than that, the laws have not changed. They're merely not enforced. In Vancouver, we have 15 or 16 dispensaries operating quite openly now, but we don't operate within any kind of legislative framework, and any one of us can be raided or, or shut down at any time. And indeed, in other parts of the province, other parts of the country, for eight people who try to open up dispensaries to help some sick patients often do get raided. There was five places raided in, in British Columbia in 2011, and they'll be going to trial over the coming year and a half or so, and hopefully we'll get some positive results out of that. But, uh, but so for the most part, the laws have not actually changed. Most of the advances we've had have been in terms of getting the law ignored and, and people battling to create bubbles and zones of tolerance. And we have one of those in Vancouver and a few other parts of the province. But I tell you, these things could be rolled back as they rolled back things in the 1970s. And so when I looked at how the laws have actually been changed and where they've actually succeeded in changing the laws, I looked to the US and I see, of course, Washington and Colorado both had these wonderful referendums to legalize marijuana and move to a fully legally regulated system. And at the same time, Massachusetts became the 18th state to legalize medical access to cannabis. And that's an average of more than one state a year since 1996 when California became the first state to have a referendum on that issue. 
And in every single one of those instances, it was not the governments of those states magnanimously from the top down changing those laws. Indeed, the governors of those states always campaigned against all these changes. And in Washington and Colorado, these governments that said, no, we don't want to do this, are now in the position of having to put these laws into place and figure out how they're going to create a legal cannabis industry in those states, probably against a lot of pressure from the federal U.S. government and the Obama administration. But nevertheless, changing the laws to a referendum seems to be the best and only way that this has been done anywhere in the U.S., and I think we can do the same thing here in Canada. Because British Columbia is the only province that has a referendum system. So we're the only province where citizens can get together, can gather signatures, get their, write their own law, get it on the ballot, and get it passed. But it's very difficult to do so in BC. It's harder in British Columbia to get something on the ballot than it is in any American state that has a referendum system. Or indeed, any referendum system in the world that I know of. Ours is a higher threshold here. I'll come back to that in a bit. But. Um, what I did is I got together with a guy named Kirk Tussaud. Kirk Tussaud is a brilliant lawyer. He's won us many important victories in the courts, major constitutional challenges to stand up for the rights of patients to get their medicine and to curb some of the excesses of the federal government's war on drugs. And we tried to figure out what we could do as a province here where we have a broad consensus in British Columbia now that it's time to change the law. But too often the argument goes that we're powerless before the federal government. And I don't think that's the case. And so Kirk and I got together and we figured out what we could do in British Columbia. And we wrote a law, and that law is called the Sensible Policing Act. And we submitted that law to Elections BC because they won't let you have a referendum on something if your law is unjurisdictional or unconstitutional or not a valid law. And we actually had to go back and forth a little bit to tweak it and to make some changes until their lawyers would agree that this law was something in the jurisdiction of British Columbia. And so they agreed. And they actually started the clock to have a, to get the signatures to have a referendum. But we said, no, no, hang on. We're going to withdraw that. We're going to work on that later. But what the legislation we wrote does is it decriminalizes cannabis possession in British Columbia and it moves us, starts us on the path towards a legally regulated system. And we do this by taking advantage of provincial jurisdiction over policing and the administration of justice. This isn't some legal trick or something. It's, it's indeed how our system is designed. The provincial attorney general and the provincial government has jurisdiction over policing and has the right and responsibility to tell the police in British Columbia where to focus their resources and their time and their money and where not to focus their resources and their time and their energy. So the Sensible Policing Act amends the Police Act. And that's legislation that empowers all police in British Columbia to do their jobs, RCMP, municipal police, transit police. And it instructs them to spend no more time or resources searching, seizing, detaining, or arresting anybody for simple possession of cannabis. They are to make that the absolute lowest priority such that no resources are spent on enforcing that particular legislation. People sometimes say, well, isn't that the case already? Like, I was smoking a joint. The cop has told me to put it out. He didn't bust me. And if you live in Vancouver, that's especially true. Because in Vancouver, they lay less than 10 cannabis possession charges every year. They have a policy to not really worry about otherwise law-abiding citizens who are consuming cannabis. But in the rest of British Columbia, possession charges have been skyrocketing. They were at kind of a low in 2005, but still pretty close to the overall average of about 1,700 charges every year. And for the time before that, it never got over 2,000 charges for the two years before that. And at that time, you might recall that liberals were in power and they were talking about decriminalization. It was kind of in the air a little bit in 2005. Charges were on a downward trend. When Harper came to power in 2006, we saw about a 25% increase in possession charges in the first year. And they've gone up every single year since then in a steady progression. By 2010, they had more than doubled. And by 2011, the last year we have statistics for, there was 3,700 possession charges in British Columbia, just for cannabis, over 10 a day being laid. There was also, in 2005, about 15,000 incidences where the police would write a report about dealing with somebody who had cannabis but where they didn't lay a charge. That number has increased by 30% over that time to more than 20,000 times a year now that the police, especially the RCMP, are filing a report about dealing with somebody for possession of cannabis. Now, the rate of cannabis might have gone up a little bit over the last five or six years, but it hasn't gone up 30%. It hasn't doubled over that time. This is purely a policy direction of the RCMP that they've decided on their own to lay more charges. So does it put an end to that? This legislation would get that number down from 3,700 a year to as close to zero as we could get. To deal with minors in possession of cannabis, our legislation specifies that it empowers a police officer to treat possession of cannabis the same as, but no more severely than possession of alcohol. 
So a police officer could seize cannabis from a minor in possession and could potentially write them a ticket as if it were alcohol, but the penalty cannot be any more severe. And there's no handcuffing, arresting, criminal records, any of those things that can really harm a young person for the rest of their life. And a young person with a medical exemption, of course, would be treated sexually according to that. So that's the first part. And we know this is going to solve all the problems to deal with cannabis in British Columbia, but this would get cannabis users off the front lines of the war on drugs, and it allows police to spend their time on more substantive criminal offenses. Now, the second part of this legislation wants us to go further, right? So what the second part of this law does is it mandates the Attorney General to formally call upon the federal government and demand them to change the cannabis laws, or else give British Columbia an exemption so we can try and expand their gear as a province. And they have the power to do that. The Minister of Health has the power to exempt any person or any class of persons from any part of the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act. That's the part they used to use for medical marijuana patients, and that's also the section that they used to keep insight open as well, Section 56. It gives them the power to say, we're going to let British Columbia try something different if they choose. And at the same time as we ask the federal government, will you change the cannabis laws, it also sets up a commission at the provincial level to figure out what we want to change them to. Because like tobacco and alcohol, marijuana will fall under provincial jurisdiction when it's legalized. There could be some federal laws, like with alcohol, about importing and exporting, and about labeling, and a few things like that. But for the most part, these things are dealt with at the provincial level. Points of sale, tax rates, hours of opening, how we deal with all those kind of questions are done at the provincial level. So we've created a commission that would go around the province, that would talk to citizens, talk to experts, talk to researchers and scientists, and all those kind of people, and come up with a set of rules and regulations around legal marijuana in British Columbia, so that when the federal government says yes, we've got this thing in place that we can then, an infrastructure and a set of rules in place that we can then activate. And then we're no longer debating if we should legalize marijuana, but rather, what are we going to legalize it? How are we going to legalize it? What's, what's the actual procedure going to be? So I think this would be a great law. And you might agree, this would be wonderful to get this passed. But how do we get this law enacted and made into law in British Columbia? Well, any province can pass a law like this. All it takes is the government willing to, to do so. And certainly, Christy Clark could recall the legislature, and we could have this passed in a week or two if she wanted. And if the polls are right, and Adrian Dix becomes our next premier, then he also could come make his party bring this legislation forward and, and pass this within the NDP. And yet, when we ask them now about this law, they both say, well, it's, it, Christy Clark will just say, it's federal jurisdiction. I don't want to talk about it. Adrian Dix will say, well, I support decriminalization, but it's a federal issue, and I don't really want to talk about it. <clears throat> we actually have a couple of wonderful precedents for the idea that the provinces can stand up to the federal government. This wouldn't be the first time we've done something like this. In 2003, British Columbia joined seven other provinces in saying we're not going to enforce the long gun registry. And at that time, attorney generals across Canada said, this long gun registry, it's, it's criminalizing otherwise law-abiding citizens. And it's costing us a ton of money we can't afford. And no one's following this law anyway. So we're just not going to enforce it. We're refusing to enforce that law. Eight provinces refused to enforce the long gun registry. They essentially decriminalized possession of an unregistered long gun in the exact same way that we want to decriminalize possession of cannabis by telling the police and prosecutors to ignore this. And another example quite recently, like I mentioned, is the supervised injection site, Insight, where the federal government said, we control drug policy, we want to shut it down. Come on in, come on in, no worries. There's a few seats around. The federal government said, we want to shut down Insight, drug policy is our jurisdiction, and we want to close it. And the province of BC said, no, that place saves lives, it increases public order, it helps <coughs> prevent the spread of disease, we want to keep it open. We went, we went to court, and we won. Insight is still there, and the long gun registry is gone. And however you feel about those issues, the point is the province has the power to stand up to the federal government on these kinds of things, and when we do, we can win as well. So it would be great if either party or both parties were to stand up and pass this law, but the way history shows us, I think we're going to have to have a referendum here in British Columbia and push this law through ourselves, because I think our political leaders are not brave enough to pass this law for us. So of course, you should be contacting your MLA, talk to Nicholas Simons. He's actually quite a good friend of our cause. And he spoke to an event we put on in Victoria. We had 500 people came out, and Nicholas was on our panel and spoke about his support for changing the cannabis laws. And we've had four liberal MLAs come out over the last while also supporting that change. I don't think any of them are running again on this election, which is not a coincidence. But nevertheless, this shows it's a nonpartisan issue. It's not even so much a right or a left-wing issue. The Fraser Institute, the right, the right-wing brain, you know, think tank for the right-wingers, they also support changing the marijuana laws and really changing our whole war on drugs. So it's not a, a partisan left or right-wing issue at all. It's more of a common sense issue. It's a sensible issue. 
And so to have a referendum in British Columbia, to get this law on the ballot, we need to collect the signatures from 10% of the registered voters in every single one of British Columbia's 85 electoral districts. And if we just get 9.9% in one district, we fail to get on the ballot. It's a very high threshold. It comes to about 400,000 people around the province, roughly. And they all have to sign on in a 90-day period. You only have three months to collect all those signatures. It's a huge effort. That is why we've only ever had one referendum in British Columbia. Of course, that was to try to get rid of the HST. Now, polls show that there's more British Columbians who support changing the cannabis laws that supported getting rid of the HST. But what that campaign had is infrastructure. They had unions, they had the NDP, they had business groups. They had a broad range of different groups working together who know how to get bodies in the street and know how to make things happen. But the way we're trying this campaign, no one has ever tried this strategy before, what we're doing, to spend a very long lead up time building support, getting volunteers in place, and getting your supporters registered so that we know where our supporters are, our volunteers are well trained, and we have the time to make this campaign work. Now our referendum system has fixed election dates, so no matter when we have the signatures, the referendums are scheduled to happen every three years in September. It's entirely separate from the, from the provincial election system or the municipal one. It's entirely its own system. Every three years in September. But of course, no one knows that because we never have referendums on it either. But the next one is scheduled for September 2014. So whether we have the signatures in hand now or next year, it's still September 2014. So we have the, the opportunity to take a little bit of time to do this right. So that 90 day clock is going to start in September of this year. September, October, November, we're going to hopefully by then have, if not all 400,000 people pre-registered, a big enough chunk that we've got a big head start. And we can tell our signature gatherers, here's the 100 people in your neighborhood who already said they're going to sign, they already registered, we've already emailed them, called them, they know you're coming, just go to their house and get them to sign the official form and get that turned into our office. That's probably the only way we can have a real good chance of making this happen and getting this through. And it can be done, let me assure you, we can do this. It will not be easy, but I believe we can accomplish this if we all work together. And uh, so that's how we get it on the ballot. And if we succeed in that time, if we can make it happen <coughs> in September, October, November, then the vote will happen in September 2014. And I'm confident we will win that referendum. The easy part will be winning the vote. We'll have to campaign and, and get our message out, but polls show right now that we would win with at least 65 up to 85 percent support, depending on how you ask the question. About 85% of British Columbians support the idea that someone in possession of cannabis should not get a criminal record or be a priority for the police. And about two-thirds of British Columbians say they'd be comfortable living in a province where marijuana was legalized and sold and made available to adults in some fashion. So I expect we'd get somewhere between those two numbers. But getting on the ballot is the hard part. Getting those signatures is the hard part. And it's not a matter of anybody else stopping us. It's not a matter of the police or Stephen Harper or the forces of darkness stopping us. It's entirely up to us as a movement and those who believe in this issue to get together and make it happen. Our only challenge is ourselves and whether we have the ability and the desire and the passion to get those signatures to make this happen, to use our democratic tools to get this on the ballot and make history here in British Columbia. Now, I have a daughter who's 15 years old. Some of you here have kids of your own. Others hopefully will have children of your own one day. And I would love it if my daughter's children could grow up in a world where they never happen to know about cannabis prohibition. And I have a dream that I want to share with you and that I hope you will imagine this, this positive future with me. Where one day, you're a senior citizen, you're older, and you're there with your grandchild, it's in the morning, and she's, he or she is reading a history book, getting ready for school, doing a little homework before class, before they take off to get the school bus. And they, they're reading their history book and they turn to you and they say, Grandma, Grandpa, I'm I'm reading in my history book here that the cannabis plant used to be illegal for like almost a hundred years. People would go to jail for using this plant and it was a really big deal. They spent hundreds of millions of dollars and there was all these campaigns and it goes on for quite a few pages in my book here. And yet, and yet I know that our house is built out of cannabis hemp fiber board and I'm pretty sure the school bus that we could take to school runs on hemp fuel. And I know we have hemp granola for breakfast like we do every morning. And, uh, and I know that you use cannabis medicines to help treat the aches and pains of, of being a senior citizen, so how can this be true that this plant used to be illegal? What's up with that? That seems really weird. And I want you to be able to say, yeah, it's true. For most of my life it was like that, and it was a big deal, and people would go to jail, and maybe some of my friends got arrested and had problems like that, but you know what? I helped make a difference, and when Sensible BC came to Powell River, I decided I was going to get involved, and I was going to work hard. And I collected signatures, and I talked to people, and I spread the word, and I worked every day for those seven months, and then I campaigned hard for a year. 
And when I cast that ballot in September 2014 to criminalize and legalize marijuana in British Columbia, that was the best vote I ever cast in my entire life. And because of what we did here, the laws changed all around Canada, and that helped change the laws all around the world. And we did that so that you would never have to know what it is to be arrested or harassed for what herbal medicine you use or for what plants you choose to grow in your garden. Let's let that be the legacy that we leave to the next generation when it comes to this issue, when it comes to cannabis law reform. Let's not pass this on to another generation because things seem kind of good right now in some ways. Seeing Washington and Colorado, seeing the consensus here in BC, we have a chance, a unique chance to change these laws here right now, but it could all slip away like it did in the 1970s. And a change in government or a change in the situation here, we could easily see things going the other way. And let us not forget, at the same time, Washington and Colorado passed their wonderful laws here in <coughs> Stephen Harper's mandatory minimums came into play, where you get six months in prison as a minimum for growing six plants. Longer if it's in a rental home, if you happen to have children that live with you. These laws are just came into force in November, and they're going to be, their impact will be felt over the next coming months and coming years. And we're going to see a lot of people being in prison. And prisons are building right now. When the National Post calls, Canada's largest prison spending spree since the 1930s. That's what's happening right now in our country. So there's two paths we can go by. And I hope you will join me in this quest to change the cannabis laws, to free the people that are being oppressed by these laws, to, to free our plant and our culture from the bonds of prohibition. We can do it here, starting in Powell River, starting in British Columbia, we can make these changes happen. But it'll take a little bit of time and effort from every single one of you here over the next, next seven months. We can do that together. I hope you'll join me in this class so that we can finally end the prohibition of cannabis here in British Columbia and then all across Canada and around the world. I'm happy to answer any questions about the campaign or about cannabis or anything else you want to know, but that's my talk. Thank you very much for being here and listening to me today. Thank you very much. Yes, in the early days of Canada, actually, one of the first crops planted in Canada was hemp, uh, and um, it was, they were pushing it quite a bit. England really used a lot of cannabis for their navy, and England had great naval superiority, and they bought most of their cannabis from Russia, actually. And the problem with cannabis back then was that it was a very, it's a very labor-intensive crop, and a lot of physical effort to get cannabis ready, so places with a lot of peasants or cheap labor would grow a lot of cannabis. And they tried to push it here in Canada a lot. They had a lot of trouble getting anybody to grow cannabis in Canada, no matter how much they bribed or pushed them to do so, until about the early 1800s when the industry finally got going. In the early days of Canadian history, they were constantly trying to get people to grow uh, hemp. Jean Talon, the first French administrator of New France, uh, Nova Scotia, he wanted farmers to grow hemp so much, he actually went and confiscated all the thread out of the town and said, I'm not going to sell you any thread back, so you can't make your own clothes unless you bring me hemp. So he forced them to grow hemp in that way. And so there was a lot of pressure to grow hemp. The farmers didn't want to do it. They wanted to grow food crops so they could eat and not starve. Hemp, the way they were growing it then was for fiber, so you'd grow really tall hermaphrodite plants. There's no flowers, or you know, if you harvest them before seed. And uh, it wasn't until the 1800s that hemp really became a big thing. In fact, the Napoleonic Wars and the War of 1812 have an interesting hemp connection. Because Britain had their big navy, Napoleon had the big land army. And so Britain, when Napoleon rose to power, Britain actually blockaded Europe and kind of sealed it off, controlling the Strait of Gibraltar and the English Channel, and said no one's allowed to trade with Europe while Napoleon's there. But England was getting all their canvas and their rope for their boats from Russia. And so Napoleon said, well, we're going to block, no one's going to trade with England either. That includes you too, Russia. No selling it anymore hemp. And England would try to use American boats to get Russian hemp for a couple of years. And the Russians said, forget it, we got to sell this, we need the money. And so they started selling again. Napoleon decided to invade Russia to stop them from selling hemp. That was a disastrous move. Napoleon's army was destroyed. That really spelled the end to him. And while it was happening there, England saw, I mean, America saw the opportunity to invade Canada, maybe get some territory. They failed, of course. But uh, Canada was growing hemp, and England was trying to get us to grow more hemp so they wouldn't be dependent on Russia. But they didn't succeed in getting there until about the 1820s. And then for a long time, hemp, that was kind of the golden age of hemp in Canada from about 1815, 1820 till about the late 1800s. A lot of hemp was being grown all across the country, and that was when it really peaked. The most was being grown then. Then the steam engine was invented, and other things happened, and hemp fell out of favor after that. Long answer to a short question, but yes, indeed, hemp was a big part of the economy in early Canadian times, and also the American economy and the global economy.
economy as well. Well, um, I, uh, Ukrainian heritage, and from Saskatchewan farming community, and my mother and a lot of the old people, when I go back home, you read the history books that they compiled for the little town I came from, and they talk about how the old people, you know, 20s, 30s, 40s, would bring hemp seed from the Ukraine and then they boil it up with their poppy seed, mix a little bit of uh, honey with it, and, and they ate it as a food staple, they, a dessert. Absolutely. Poppy seeds are an amazing food source as well. Yeah. And they're really rich in a lot of essential fatty acids. And yeah. cannabis seeds, of course, are an incredible food source. And that's where most of the hemp being grown in Canada has been grown for, for seeds and stuff. Do you have a question? Yeah, Dan, can you talk about, a little bit about how to break out of the 10% of the registered <coughs> voters? For, for example, in Power River District here, in the regional district, so we're on Sculpture Day, we include um, Skidi Island, Texade Island, Sabre Island. Oh, and so this district's also Seashell, uh, it's, ele it's electoral district. So it's electoral it's district, electoral so district, that's absolutely. what it is. Right? Yeah, okay. yeah, so this would include the whole, so all the Nicole Simons area. Right. So this would be the provincial electoral that's district. Right. So provincial we electoral would be districts. the so upper and lower Sunshine Coast. So absolutely. that would be 10% of registered voters of our district. That's right, right. you got okay. it. Okay. It varies how much what the exact number is. In the most densely populated areas like Surrey, it's around 5,000 people we need. In some of the smaller ones, I think it's around 1,800 people that we need. So I'm not sure of the exact numbers here, but I'm guessing it'd be around 2,500, 3,000, something like that for for one of this kind of population. Yeah. And we actually got those numbers. Elections BC did provide us all that when we filed. One of the reasons about filing early was they give us all the stuff. The numbers will change a little bit with the provincial election because more voters will get registered, but still, it gives us an idea of sure. how much we need to each okay. I'm not sure the population of the lower Sunshine Coast. Up here, we're around <coughs> almost 19,000. Right, that's it. They have to be registered voters. They don't have to register to have a sign on, but when we come to September, right. they got to be a registered voter by September. It only takes five minutes to register online. It's very, very okay. easy right. to do. Hopefully, folks will register for the provincial election today. This is something that um, Adrian Clark tried a couple years ago um, for her to try to change the um, the voting how how we voted. Yes. She went for the not quite. The, there was we do have there was yeah. referendums on that. Yeah. But there's different systems. Those kind of referendums are called by the province. And any government can say we're going to have a vote on something whenever they want. I know we're but, that, but that well. Yeah. She might have tried some of that. I know they also tried to stop the bear hunt. People have tried a few other things. They all <coughs> failed miserably. Like nobody came even close except for the HST one. But they all also just kind of said, let's go and just started. And it's very, it's just a lot of people have to be in place. You need hundreds of volunteers and, and lots of people. That's why I've been traveling all around the province to find people in every single town. Just even a few people. Sometimes I'm talking to five or six people. Sometimes I'm talking to 60 or more, right? But you only need a few people in some of these small towns to be the ones that can that can coordinate it for that area. But it is a monumental, monumental task we're looking at here. Uh, you said you, uh, you want to start with Powell River. And um, you're looking for votes, or do you have other ideas planned? Well, we're not looking for votes right now. What I'm looking for is volunteers and people to register themselves, right? Because when you register for our campaign, when you can register online, they've got these sign-up sheets here as well that you can, I'm hoping some of you will take with you, get your friends and family, coworkers and neighbors to sign up and then mail them into us. And what that does for us is it lets us see where our support is. And when September comes, our volunteers don't have to go knocking on random doors, don't have to go to the mall and try to find people. Hopefully we have everybody registered, or at least enough they have a big head start where they can get halfway there but with the folks that are already signed up. still votes you're looking for. They're looking for volunteers. Well, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, they're not really votes, but they're, they're supporters. But it's not really a vote, but same kind of like to do here in Powell River that would say, you know, put more light on this, on this idea rather than the campaign itself. So, um, you know, more of a... Do you understand what I mean? Like you mean educating people and getting them on board kind of thing or doing kind of things like that? I mean, I'm more curious about your ideas. You know, I feel that in this campaign, our goal is not really to bring on new people because the polls show that we already have the support. So although I certainly want to convert people or educate people who aren't sure about this, I also tell our volunteers, if someone's against this, don't waste your time arguing with them. Move to the next person who supports us because we do have the support out there. So I feel with this campaign, said although you know we want to educate people, it's more educating them about what this legislation is, how the referendum system works, like all those kind of things, what 
we mean when we say decriminalize, people constantly email me, we should only legalize, or we should only decriminalize, and if the other one is bad somehow, and so things like that, I, I, I think we could educate and teach people more about what we're trying to do in that regard. I don't have any specific other events planned up here, although what we like to see is when local people take that on. Our crew in Kelowna has been very active every week. They go do a, a bridge drop, or they go to a concert or an event, and they're sending us stacks of sign-up sheets from their cities where they've registered. And other areas are doing kind of, we got a guy in Victoria putting on local events, so I'm hoping that we can develop local communities that will put on things in their own areas, and we can all kind of coordinate and work together. We can certainly supply materials, and things like that, but I'm looking for kind of local people that are excited by this and want to want to get involved and take it on. And then we can also talk to our coordinated different people in each community and have meetings among the, the organizers. If we want to mail stuff, we can just send it to one person, they can distribute it around, that kind of thing. We had a question back there. Um, I believe you mentioned that, that your goal is suggested 65% support. Was that your question? 65% support sort of legalization and around 85% support the idea that possession shouldn't be a crime. So it's in there somewhere. So what I'm, what I'm, um, given that it's an election year, um, and given that you said that both leaders are trying to drop us like a hot potato, I'm kind of curious why they would do that, given the groundswell of support. I asked that question myself as well. I will say that when you take on this issue, first of all, I mean, the NDP I feel, feels they're going to win. They don't want to take on something controversial. They're just in a, just be quiet. We're going to just all screw up right now, right? So taking on a controversial yeah. issue when they don't have to. And aside from this campaign, to most people, the answer, it's a federal issue. I can't do anything. Well, all right, that's like an easy out. So if they can take that easy out, that's better than potentially offending somebody by taking a strong stance on it. And I also think that you take on powerful enemies when you do that, particularly the RCMP. And they are a politically active police force. They have played roles in our elections before. And the RCMP for the last 100 years have really been some of the primary motivators of, of prohibition in Canada. And have been quite active in encouraging for stronger laws and pushing for more powers and more tools to, to deal with this stuff. And they also say horrendous things about marijuana and drug uses all the time. The last 100 years, they say we're we're immoral, deceitful, evil people that don't, you know, have bad morality and are, and, uh, and are innately harmful. So, so I think that when you, if you're going to challenge the RCMP, it could come back on you. They, they said they've, they've been political in our province and in our federal government before, and I think it's easier for our political leaders so far just to say, oh, I can't, I can't do anything. Don't ask me. But we're going to change that, and certainly part of our effort will be to get our members and to get the ideas out there to people that we want to push our political leaders to take a stand on. Shirley Bond was, was given that answer, oh, it's nothing, I can't do anything about it, and Cash he called her on it recently, and he said, no, that's not true, of course they can do something, that's a, a non-answer, and you know, I'm not running again, so I can say my mind now. But, um, but certainly, we want to get that debate out there and say, look, you know, our PC government stood up for unregistered long guns, they stood up for injection drug users, they can stand up for cannabis users as well if they want to, and they should. At, at UBC um, last September, the yes. vote was approximately 70%, and the people that were in the room, which was most of the politicians from around the province, who voted in favor of decriminalization. Absolutely. So we have that. And, and that's huge. And, and when Shirley Bond signed our last <coughs> contract with the RCMP that extends it another 20 years of their wonderful policing in our province, the, the municipalities, she said that this gives us unprecedented control over the RCMP spending and priorities and that municipalities will have more power than ever before to make sure the police are spending their resources the way they want and keeping the, the cost down. And we just recently had a big convention in, in Victoria, I think, talking about the cost of policing and how to keep the cost of policing down. So it seems to me that it's a no-brainer that the you know, cities are calling to not waste the money on, on busing people for possession. That they've doubled the number of incidences. We're estimating up to $20 million a year is being spent in British Columbia just dealing with cannabis possession charges and cannabis possession incidences. And um, and so, yeah, it's time for a change, absolutely. And in this time of fiscal austerity, which you know, it always is really, why are we wasting money uh, targeting cannabis users? Why do you think the RCMP's ramped up the, uh, you know, the possession charges? I think there's a couple of reasons. I think one is they're responding to the tone from Ottawa. I don't think it's coincidences that charges started going up when Stephen Harper came to power. Now, the mandatory minimums don't affect possession. They only affect trafficking if you're trafficking in over three kilos, which I do, by the way, at my dispensary, so I fall under those mandatory minimums. 
as do all of our staff facing one year jail sentence. It's actually 18 months because we have a rented uh, building. But, um, but I think they're responding to the tone from Ottawa. I think also perhaps to show that crime rates are dropping, maybe they feel they have nothing else better to do with their time now. That, they, that the other crime is lower and they feel they got more spare time to go after pot smokers because it's an endless amount out there. Like it's a very arbitrary decision how many they're gonna blast. It's an arbitrary decision that they're gonna charge 3,700 out of the 20,000 incidents that they have. If they really, as they say, we just enforce the law, we have no choice, they should lay 20,000 possession charges every year. Right. But if they did that, the war would end. People would say, well, this is ridiculous. We're spending 50 million, 100 million dollars a year. My kid got busted, we can't have that. But because it's not, most people get off, and the ones that do get charged, it's very arbitrary. You know, if you're a white, middle-class person living in a bigger city, your odds of getting busted for possession are a lot lower. If you're a younger, browner person living further north or more rural, your chances of getting busted are a lot bigger. But it's more than just that. It also depends on which cop you get. Some cops are really, marijuana is bad, I'm going to get you. Other ones are going to be like, whatever, just put it out. You know, so really, it's very arbitrary. But there aren't very many other crimes where you have a one in six chance of being, when you're caught, you only have a one in six chance of being charged. Like, it doesn't work like that for any other kind of offense, except really for possession and, and marijuana possession, especially. And actually, 45% of all drug charges laid in, in BC are for cannabis possession. 15% are for all other marijuana crimes, and then 40% are for all other drug crimes combined. So all, over half of our drug war is aimed at marijuana, and 45% of it is aimed at marijuana users, essentially. And that seems like an odd place for the priorities. But they're just the low-hanging fruit, right? There's a lot of them out there. Anybody else want to know anything? What do you tell people, like I've been trying to get people to sign zip papers and they're scared that as soon as their name's on the paper, they're going to be in line for being busted next. You know, so what Yeah, people are afraid sometimes. Them? I mean, we're not sharing this database with anybody, it's just for us. And it's not going to get used for anything, but to contact you again in September, unless you're volunteering. Otherwise, you're not really going to hear from us until September when we want to get your signature. And even when we submit all those signatures to the government, to Elections BC, there's going to be 400,000 names. They don't actually read every one. They do a statistical analysis on various sections and see if you've got the right amount. And if that's good, they don't even look at the whole thing, right? They just pull out random pages and look at those. But ultimately, the RCMP have, you know, they're not looking for more pot smokers on a list of people. And I bet that most of that list of people in the end are not going to be marijuana users. You know, I think that the core people, many who get involved, certainly they enjoy cannabis themselves, and that's one of the reasons they care about the issue. But that 60% or 85% or 66% of British Columbians that want to change the law, most of them don't smoke pot. And a lot of them don't necessarily even like marijuana or think it's a good thing. They just recognize that legalization is the way to reduce the harm. A lot of people who voted for Stephen Harper don't support marijuana prohibition. Absolutely. They're voting, they disagree on that, but they're voting for other reasons. Marijuana is not the issue they vote on. They're voting for other stuff, but there's plenty of folks who are, who are conservatives or right wingers, Stephen Harper supporters, who just don't agree on that issue, including many of the papers that endorsed Harper. Most of the last election, most of the journalists and media that endorsed him, they all said, we're not really keen on those mandatory minimums. I'm hoping he'll lay off on the pot people, but we're still endorsing him anyways, right? So there's certainly a broad range of people that are going to be on there. So I mean, if people are scared, it's unfortunate that they feel that they're going to be persecuted for their political beliefs if they're coming to an event. <laughs> especially in small towns that I've been to, on the, like in the Sparwood and Fernie, where they're mining towns, especially Sparwood, a lot of mining people there, and they say, we could come out, they've just instituted random drug testing on us. We show up at a marijuana event, we could lose our jobs, right? And that's a valid concern, but it's unfortunate. And I don't, people have to make their own decisions, but. I don't think the risk, I mean, I know the risks I go through every day. I don't think the risk of putting your name on a piece of paper, ultimately, it's a pretty small risk for a pretty big reward of making this war change for the next generation, right? So, but you people have to make the risk. yourself? I do, yes. Okay. Absolutely. Do you have to take off? Can we sign your registration? You sure can, yeah, for sure. Um, I if you sign up online, then you don't need to uh, sign a game. But, um, if you sign up online, then you don't need to uh, sign the form again. So it's up to you. If you want to take these forms, you can do that as well. Do you have a question now? What about the pharmaceutical company, the lobbyist for that, against cannabis because of their profit margins? That's a big force. I'd say the RCMP and the pharmaceutical industry are two of the biggest groups against cannabis prohibition, cannabis legalization, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think you need to take a look at the 
that's very true. I think they, and certainly from our dispensary, we see how a lot of patients turn away from government subsidized pharmaceuticals. Thanks for coming, I appreciate it. Uh, they turn away from government subsidized pharmaceuticals and towards marijuana. They're going to buy it out of their own pocket. So they're saving taxpayers money, and I really think the cannabis should be legally subsidized, or at least the price should drop. There's no reason for cannabis to be so expensive. It's only prohibition. People sometimes say, if we legalize it, they'll tax it, and it'll be way too expensive, and they're going to wreck it. It's better the way it is. But any legal system has to compete with what we have now. We already have a robust marijuana industry. If the government's legal marijuana was 20 bucks a gram and half the potency, and no one's going to buy it, no one's going to want it. So a legal system has to have cannabis of equal or better price and equal or better quality to what's out there now. And there's no reason it, it couldn't be. But I, obviously, I don't. Although our legislation doesn't specify the system of legalization, and we have this commission to figure it out, I, I really like the wine model for how wine is produced, and I'd like to mimic that for how we produce cannabis in our province. Also, including on that the science and research into cannabis use of where they're distancing themselves from it because it might become true. Well, and you the panacea of, of, of health that we can transform these things. Well, and what's special about cannabis raw medicine is they're so really so incredibly cheap to produce and that people can produce them themselves and make quite potent extracts, if not themselves, and it's a cottage industry anyways, like very effectively. And especially in countries, third world countries, where pharmaceuticals are not available, they're just out of the reach of a lot of people. Being able to grow your own medicine is wonderful. And in first world countries too, of course, but anywhere in the world, it's important to be able to grow your own medicine. Absolutely. And I, I was just saying about the wine model, I was just going to expand on that a little bit, because if you want to brew wine in your own home, you can do that. You can share it with your friends, as long as you're not selling it to them. There's a limit how much you can make, but as long as you're being safe about it, you can make your own wine. You can go to a you brew place and get someone else to make your wine for you, your specifications. You can, anybody can open a winery. There isn't only five or six government-run wineries that control the whole industry. There's big wineries, <clears throat> there's small little niche wineries. And cannabis, I think, lends itself to that, because there's no one best kind of marijuana. People who enjoy cannabis like different kinds and different strains and, and different ones. It's like wine. There's no one best kind of wine. People like to try different kinds. So I think that the marijuana market would lend itself to multiple smaller producers and some bigger companies as well. But it's not going to be like De Maurier or cigarettes where you just buy one kind of tobacco that you enjoy. That's not going to be able to compete. And I think really in the legal market, it's not going to be so much about the smokable buds. That'll be a big thing, but it'll be about extracts. You know, For most of European history, people took tinctures, and that was the way mm. marijuana medicine was used. And actually the product that I think will become the most popular marijuana product of all time is the skin cream. We sell a skin cream, a oh, right. righteous cream in our dispensary, and it's mm. marijuana-infused cream. It's, it will be psychoactive if you ate several jars of it, but you're gonna, that's not going to work, and it's whatever, that's not going to happen. But it's safe, it's safe for a baby, safe for anybody. This stuff will be incredible treatment for arthritis. It's great for eczema, for psoriasis, for cuts and scrapes. It's good for post-surgical pain and, and chronic pain. It's an amazing stuff. We get letters from people all the time saying, I've been in pain for 10 years, 20 years, tried all kinds of stuff. I rubbed that cream on me. I felt good for the first time ever. And that product, will, I think, be available. Everybody will have it in their cabinet, whether or not they, whatever they feel about cannabis. That kind of stuff will become really widespread. People who like smoking cannabis are going to keep smoking it. But some folks who like smoking cannabis in a legal system would turn away from that and prefer to do it a different, different way. Because smoking can be good medicine. I'm not arguing that, absolutely. But it's also hard to do in your workplace. It's hard to do maybe around your kids or in different environments. If you can use a tincture or use a vaporizer or eat a capsule or a cookie that you know exactly what the potency is, it would be exactly the same as the last capsule you got. I think that'll, that'll be popular for a lot of people, absolutely. I've already written my letter to uh, Christy Clark. I've got my own issue that ties in with what you're doing. So what you're doing is helping me immensely. So I, I sent my letter to Christy Clark, and then she passed me off to Shirley Bond. Is that a good thing, or how do Well, I that's what they do. I mean, usually the premier often will try to pass you off to someone else, so they don't have to answer. So can I so. pick on her again, then? Oh, well, you can write, yeah. I mean, you don't want to be polite. You know, I encourage people not to, you know, be rude or anything. Yeah, definitely write to Christy, write to Shirley, and share their answers with us. If they, if they give you comments about the marijuana issue, about this kind of stuff, send them to us, let me know. We'll post them, we'll share them around. I mean, we want to get them to comment on it. 
and they really don't want to comment because they know that they're going to make somebody mad if they say the wrong thing, right? So Adrian knows that NDP is want to decriminalize. He doesn't want to alienate other people, so we just kind of, well, it's worth decrim, but that's I'm not going to do anything about it, though. But at least I'm on your side a little bit. Well, and, uh, and then Christy will just say it's a federal issue. She won't take a side on it at all because she's trying to straddle different groups, some of whom are really against pot, some of whom support it, right? So she, does, she doesn't want to offend anybody, so she's just going to not comment on it. But ultimately, there's a lot of people that wanted to see these laws change, and we're voters too, right? So we got to make sure that our, our voice is heard. And the ultimate victory would be if we never have to have a referendum. If we can convince either party to, to just pass this law, that's even better, right? I don't, you know, the time and expense of having a referendum is a big challenge. And in fact, the way I would frame it to our political leaders is like this. I'll say, well, look, if we win the referendum on this, will you promise to pass this law then? Well, they've got to kind of say yes to that, right? They're not going to say, no, I'm going to ignore democracy. Well, if you say, okay, yes, yeah, I'll pass this law if you win a referendum. Then you ask, well, why are you making this have a referendum? Polls already show that the vast majority of British Columbians want to pass this law. We know it's going to win. Why are you making us do all this hassle with something that you said you'll do if we support it? You know we all support it. Let's just pass it. So that's the kind of you know back and forth. I'm, I'm hoping to have that kind of debate to get that idea out there. If they're going to pass it when we win a referendum. Then why not just save us all millions of dollars for a, we know we're going to win. Why make us do this, right? But so ultimately, the best way to get that is to get the signatures and get it on the ballot and make it happen. And if you win a referendum, there's no going back. Like, under the legislation, technically, they have the power not even to pass it at that point, but they're not going to do that. That would be political suicide. And it would be, if the NDP is in power, many in the NDP caucus would be very upset if they said, no, we're just not going to do it anyways, right? Like, we have to make it as easy as possible for them to pass this, and the easiest way is to win a referendum where they don't even have any choice anymore, right? So, that's what the plan is. Like, we want to put pressure on it on all sides, at least. And all so, I can't, so, just keep writing everything. Yeah, write to Rick. Write to Rick. Write, write back. Write to Shirley Bond. Write to Adrian Dix. Write to Nicholas Simons. Thank you for his comments. Write to those four liberal MLAs who came out. Oh, Cash sheet yeah, and others. I, I mean, Brad you know. But uh, so write to Rick. Right. Anybody who comes out, write to them, talk to them. Yeah. Did you have something? Sure. Or? Oh, I was just curious whether or not you uh, think it was related to the law or any cases that you uh, been mandatory. Not really yet, but I mean, they only came into force in November, so people who have been charged since November, and I'm not... I'm not aware of any like that. There's a guy just recently, he was in the paper, who got uh, like nine months, he was growing 500 plants, but they were all small beat up plants, and half of his family uses it for medical use, and he wasn't really like a big time guy or anything. And he's getting nine months under the mandatory, so he'd get two years, maybe three years, if he has a 13 year old son who lives on that farm with him then having a kid around makes it one and a half times the penalty. So nine months, Ian Mulder had a column like decrying this penalty, but he didn't mention that if he'd been busted after November, he would have gotten two or three years. Uh, but I'm not aware of anybody yet. And they do have the discretion not to use the mandatory minimum if they want to. And I think it's going to lead to a lot of plea bargaining, right? They'll say, we caught you with 550 plants. That's two years in jail. But if you just plead <laughs> to like 199 plants or whatever, you'll only get six months. Otherwise, we got in. So people will, it'll make them happy because they can avoid trials. Trials are very expensive. It gets you in jail for a while. So hey, win-win, except for the people who go to prison. But I think that's what the mandatory minimums will lead to. A lot more plea bargaining, more discretion on the part of police and prosecutors, and way less discretion on the part of judges. It'll be the cops and the prosecutors who decide. Because what they charge you with, like once you get there, that'll be it for the judge, right? So. Um, so when we get the 400,000 signatures and pass the referendum, does the legislature then get to um, nitpick the sensible policing act and make changes to it, or does it does it pass as as it was written before the referendum? They do have the power to do whatever they want. They could even not pass it. They can they can say we don't care. We're just not doing it. But so that's I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think I'm being overly optimistic in saying that's not going to happen. They could nitpick it if they wanted. I think we've written a pretty solid piece of legislation that doesn't really, there's not a lot of room to wiggle around. We do have the coming year that we could change it from what we've submitted already if we wanted to. I don't really want to make changes, but if somebody points out a, a flaw or if it turns out people are really upset about some aspect of it, and you can read the bill, I have copies, you can read it online, it's all there, it's not very, it's a little bit legalistic, but it's not very complicated, it's only a page and a half, it's a pretty simple piece of legislation. We wanted to make it as simple and accessible as possible, right? So. 
Um, but uh, but yeah, they could tweak it if they wanted to. It would be like whatever they do, it's going to be a huge story. It'll be the top story at that time if this thing passes, right? It'll be a big deal. So whatever they do will be done under the full spotlight of everybody watching what's happening and how they do it, right? And there's some little changes I wouldn't necessarily even mind. I mean, depending on what they do, as long as they don't gut it. Mm -hmm. But uh, but you know, minor tweaks, I don't really care too much as long as the essence of it holds true, right? But uh, but I would hope we could make any tweaks beforehand so that we've got a pretty good consensus on. And I'll say that even you know on the liberals, I mean the HST was really an attack against the, the liberal party. They introduced this legislation, they created it, people were bailed. But neither party created this stuff. I mean the NDP didn't do it, the liberals didn't do it. They may have, you know, had a little thing, but it's been around much longer than any of them have. So it's not like it's we're attacking either party. We just want them to do something. We're not blaming them for its origins, like the HST thing, right? So it shouldn't be like it's not seen as an attack on either party. So hopefully they'll they'll go with the democratic will of the people and make it happen. And with Washington doing it right across the border, also it like, really strengthens our hand. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I mean, people can take these with them. They're double sided. They have our information on the bottom, our mailing address, our phone number, our email address. You can scan it, you can mail it, you can take a picture in your iPhone as long as it's good quality and send us that. Any of that kind of stuff. Yeah, there you go. There's some more. You can make comments. Oh, yeah. We got lots, right? No more is okay. And if you want extra uh, flyers, I've got a lot of those. Take as many as you need, give them to other people. I've got, this is a little flyer actually just by the city of Vancouver. It's not explicit to our campaign. It's just a little harm reduction flyer on how to be a safe, responsible marijuana user. I think it's the best kind of flyer that I've ever seen. It doesn't say marijuana equals heroin equals death. It says, try to smoke organic cannabis if you're going to use it. Try to use a vaporizer. Watch out sharing a joint with someone who's got the flu. You might catch the flu. If you're going to eat pot food, don't eat too much right away. Wait a little while, then have more later. It's really good. It's common sense advice. They incorporated the cannabis community in when they wrote this. And I think it's just a handy little flyer. And I like doing those up to people because that's kind of cannabis education we need. Certain doctors are against it. Certain doctors are for it. That's yeah. the education of the doctor itself. There's another one. Well, challenge. I, I have patients come to me all the time who say, my doctor knows I use marijuana, they even encourage me to use it because it helps me, but they won't sign my papers, I don't know what to do. And I hear that all the time from people, and I wish I had a big list of helpful doctors, which I don't really. There's a couple that operate online, and will talk to you by Skype if you've already been diagnosed. They can perhaps sign your papers for a couple hundred bucks, which might be a really good deal, might be gouging, depending on how you look <laughs> at it, but they help a lot of people. I don't know right, what to say, but I, it is it is something that's out there. But it's, uh, it's a challenge for a lot of patients, and the new system is not going to fix that either. Doctors are still the primary gatekeepers. There's a case in Ontario where a fellow named Matt Myrna has argued that the doctors are boycotting the system, essentially, especially in rural communities. If you live in the northern BC or in Nunavut or something, there's only one doctor around. If you won't sign it, you're out of luck. And, uh, and he's had quite a bit of success in the lower courts. We've been waiting and waiting for a decision from the higher Ontario court. We'll see how that plays out. But, uh, but it's definitely a valid, a valid case that doctors are boycotting the program. And, uh, and, the, and the, physician, uh, but the physicians are, are dictated to by the pharmaceutical government. Yeah, a lot of you know, the, the cannabis they people don't the take them on junkets and golf trips to Bermuda and stuff like that to promote our new cannabis strains, right? So they have a lot of doctors with a vested interest in that. And, and it's just outside of their paradigm as well. And really, it's a herbal medicine that shouldn't really even be available. It should be available non-prescription, especially things like the cream and, and, and those kind of products. And things that aren't very psychoactive should definitely be available without prescription, in my opinion. Maybe things that are really psychoactive, maybe there should be some kind of limit. I don't know. But, but I think that, for the most part, most of the stuff could be sold over the counter today, and nobody would care or be concerned about that. Where is your dispensary? What's that? We have two in Vancouver, and there's about 15 or 16 that have opened up across Vancouver now. Um, ours, one of them is at 880 East Hastings. It's right next to the Vancouver Seed Bank, but I also found it. And the other one is on Thurlow and Davy in the West End. And uh, I didn't get a chance. Is that near the Compassion um, we're not. Well, we're not too far away. This doesn't uh, actually have our address on it. It's not our website. Anyway, Trims your hilarious buckets of tens. <laughs> but we, uh, yeah, we're East Vancouver. There's a lot of them in East Van. It's kind of a friendly area, so several of them are there, and that's where our first one and where the BCS was. What's that? There is no legislative structure behind dispensaries at all. There's no law that empowers us to do what we do. It's we do, absolutely, anywhere in Canada. 
And it's not that hard to get a membership. If you have a, a, one of the ailments on our list, then all you really need is a confirmation of diagnosis. We prefer if your doctor recommends it, oh, but really? it's not mandatory for membership. Oh, I better get that list. And, uh, and so we do have a lot of people, but people are confused. How can this be? You've been selling marijuana openly and for all of you. We have a community police station right across from us. We're, we're very good relationship with the VPD. They'll come bust us one day if they get told to, but we have a good relationship with them. They have a good relationship with us and other dispensaries. But so there's no legislation that allows us to operate. We don't even have a business licenses. But we are in good terms with the city of Vancouver, and um, it's a weird situation. What we, I wouldn't say we're illegal, because the courts consistently say what we're doing is that is constitutionally valid, that patients have a right to this medicine, and when people do get charged, for the most part, they've gotten discharges from the judges in the end. So in that sense, I think it's legal what we do, because the Constitution is the highest law of the land, and judges are saying that we are acting within the Constitution. But there's no legislation that allows us to operate. The government has not done anything to empower us. We operate purely in the tolerance of our communities and on the VPD. And they could charge us tomorrow with trafficking under mandatory minimums if they chose to. And dispensaries do get raided in some areas outside of, of Vancouver. There's a few in Victoria that are good. Comox, Chilliwack, Langley, and Burnaby all got raided in 2011. In one month, they went out to four of them. And then one in Kamloops got raided a few months later. And their trials are coming up next year. But Maple Ridge has had one for a long time, and I also helped kind of get going. They've been open for two and a half years now. No problems. Vernon, Colmox got shut down. A fellow named Ernie Yakov. He got raided twice. And it was really doing it kind of out of his home or out of a small space. But to me, what makes a dispensary a dispensary is how you screen your clients for them, right? If you sell to people who are only validly sick and you have, but whether it's out of your own home or in a storefront or by mail order or delivery, that's what makes you a dispensary is who you, how you screen your members, and hopefully you provide medical grade product to people, right? But, but uh, yeah, they got rated twice, and uh, he's got court challenges coming up, I think, later this year. And I think we're probably going to get discharges from most of these guys. I don't think they're going to actually get severe penalties. I think it's going to be good for us in some ways, although we're trying for them. And there's a case recently in Victoria, a fellow named Owen Smith, who was making cookies and food products for a dispensary there. And the police kind of stumbled across him and charged him. And the result of his case is that they determined that patients have the right to have extracts, which they didn't before, so they won that in court. And then when it came to his trial, the Crown decided to introduce no evidence. And so they ended up, he was found not guilty, but they can still, they want to be able to appeal, not his sentence, but the part about the extracts being allowed, because the government doesn't want you to have extracts. They're trying to fight that. And even if they allow it, what they're going to do, they're not going to sell them to you. They're going to let you make your own. Under the current rules, if you're a patient who gets these raw buds from Health Canada, and you, they say don't smoke it, but if you make anything else out of it, you're manufacturing marijuana, and you don't have a license for that. So no one's been charged for that, but if you were to make your own cookies out of it, you're breaking the law. And that, they're, what they're going to do is they're going to let you make your own stuff. But no one can help you, and we're not going to sell it to you, but okay, if you want to make your own cookies, we'll let you make your own cookies, or your own oil, or whatever. And some things you can make in your own home, but a lot of things you can't make in your own home. And, you know, it's not easy to make extra acts. Some are quite dangerous. Making a tincture can be challenging, right? So you should have to have the right to make some things in your own home as long as it's safe. But it shouldn't be mandatory. It shouldn't be the only way you can get your cannabis medicine. Any more than, here's a loaf of bread, get some penicillin, here's a loaf of bread, go make some penicillin, right? Like, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, you should, there should be a, a mechanism of buying these things and accessing them as well as making them. You can make your own echinacea of things if you want, but you can buy them in the store too. So anyways, there you go. That's how that... And we're seeing a lot more dispensaries opening up in Vancouver. People are, since we opened ours, we were the third one to open up. And there's been about 12 or 13 opened up since us. And uh, I think that's wonderful. As long as they all follow the same kind of standards, I think that's, uh, that's good for us. What do you feel though, as a dispensary now? Is that going to put you in more danger because of the new changes to the regulations? No, it makes no difference to us at all. We already operate outside the system anyways. I don't think it's going to impact on us. Is there going to be pressure on uh, you know, law enforcement or whoever to start enforcing that because then you're just going to be a direct competitor with people. Yeah, I, I, it might affect some people that way. I think in Vancouver, I don't see the VPD saying, now we're going to go after 16 dispensaries. Like, And it would be a big kerfuffle, to put it mildly. I mean, yeah. if they went after dispensaries, we have 4,000 patients, there's other dispensaries. They'd have to do, it would cost them a lot of money and time. If they raided us and a few other big ones a couple of times, a lot of the other ones would go underground or shut down rather than facing it. So they wouldn't have to raid all 16 places to push us underground. 
but it would it would get huge attention. There would be big protests. It would come. They would need like dozens of police officers to come out, and they'd have to raid us more than once. Right? We would three or four times we'd be shut down, but we can handle one or two raids. We stay fighting and try to stay open, and so and we're not the only one. So it would be a big hassle. But that being said, if Vision Vancouver is defeated and maybe the MPA gets in, we get a company chief of police. Maybe we get the NDP in this election, and then four years later, perhaps, who knows, maybe the BC Conservative Party takes power. That's certainly possible, that the Liberals will be destroyed, the Conservatives will take over. So in that kind of you know future, I could imagine maybe things changing a lot for us in Vancouver, if, if those kind of political changes happen. Maybe not likely, but certainly possible. But I don't think the new rules are really going to change, like because we're already illegal anyways. I don't think the new rules don't really make us any more illegal. In fact, they might even open up some venues for us in terms of... Yeah, you know, you are things like that. that they do, you know, there's people, say you've got large groups of people that are investing large amounts of money to become industrial growers now, then, you know, there might be political pressure from them. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I do say that I'm probably the only person that would say this as a businessman, but I would love it if we were put out of business because the government had better stuff than we did. <laughs> like if patients, if our patients could go to another legal, regulated, government approved, whatever place, and get a broader range of marijuana medicines and cannabis products at a better price than we did, I would love to go out of business and go bankrupt like that. That'd be awesome. Like I, <laughs> said, I don't really need to sell cannabis people myself. So I just want it to be available. And so in the long run, maybe some dispensaries will not integrate into the legal system. It depends how it goes, right? But that's not going to happen anytime soon. I'm, I'm pretty confident that we will. There will be a lot of dispensaries and a lot more places opening up in this kind of, under, you know, above ground, but non-legitimate, you know, non-legislated kind of way. I've got to find the right words to phrase do, that. Do your dispensaries pay taxes? Yeah, we pay, we pay income tax. We're a non-profit society, so we pay all the taxes for the of our employees. We don't charge HST. And that's actually kind of a point of contention. If, it, if cannabis is a prescription medication, then you don't charge HST on it. If it's a non-prescription, then you do charge the HST, right? And it's kind of a prescription medication, but it's kind of really in its own weird category. So we think of it as a prescription medication. We don't charge HST. There's a court case going on in Ontario right now about that. If, the, if it turns out that we have to, we will then pay it. But it's not so much a civil resistance, it's more just that I think we're going to win that case and we don't really have to charge it. I don't really want to have to charge my patients an extra buck 20 on $10 of cannabis, but if we have to, we will. But So it's not like a civil disobedience we refuse to pay, it's more of a court challenge, debate kind of thing, whether we should be charging that or not. But uh, I think it's more like a prescription medication, the way it's restricted than it is a non-prescription one. If we could sell it to everyone who walked in off the street and we didn't require any doctor's note, I'd be happy to pay HST, because that's a different kind of a product, in my opinion, at that point. So but for medical patients, I don't think they should be paying that. What's the number of, uh, like, what's the number, the amount of dollars brought in by revenue by the dispensaries in Vancouver? All 16, it'd probably be quite taxes. a bit of money. Yeah. Taxes, I mean, it depends. And all of our employees pay their income taxes, right? But as a nonprofit, you don't pay, like, business tax in that sense, right? Because you're a nonprofit society. But uh, I couldn't really actually estimate the dollar value of that. Plus, we bought, you know, we pay taxes in terms of the other things that we buy. We pay HST and all of our ancillary products that we that we use at our dispensary and that kind of stuff. But it's a significant amount of money, I'd say, in terms of how much we generate for the economy. And, and people who were members, a lot of them were buying cannabis before anyways, so but they were buying it entirely underground where there is nobody's paying the tax or anything else like that. So so there's a fair amount. Most of our growers, I would say, probably don't pay income tax, although some of them do. And um, we, you know, it's not up to us really to deal with that any more than we know if our plumber or electrician is paying income tax either, right? But that being said, a lot of them, I think, would be much more happy paying income tax if they knew they could call the police if somebody was robbing their room. That's kind of, you know, I think that's what taxes are for, to be part of civilized society. I'll take you and then Matt, you back then. Do you think that the proposed changes in the, the growing laws will have any effect on the no, I don't think it'll have much impact on us at all. If people have, the rules aren't fully in place yet, right? They've got a, they got a potential system they're going to put in. They're still hammering out a few details and hearing public opinion. But like Ross from back in the attic was in the news recently, right? The Olympic uh -huh. snowboarder, secondhand smoke guy, who's saying he wants to open a, a dispensary under the Health Canada rules and have a, a vapor lamp and a doctor on the premises and all that. I don't think that's allowed. I mean, they're not going to allow things like that. You know, if he operates a dispensary like that, it's going to be more similar to what we're doing, which is not a legislative within Health Canada system, right? So my understanding is the Health Canada system will be mail order only. 
and that there won't be a place you can go get it. The, the places that are growing cannabis will provide the patients only by mail order. That's my understanding of how it's going to work. And so you'll have a number of bigger producers growing only raw cannabis buds and not providing extracts in any way, and then selling those to patients by mail order. And while it's probably going to be better quality than the one kind of swaggy pot they grow now, <laughs> and actually the pot they grow now, the cannabis they grow now, to help, I've seen pictures of it when it was in its raw form. It looks like big fat colas and glistening buds. They look pretty good. Health Canada said, it's too strong. You've got 10% THC and we only wanted 7% THC. So can you do us a favor? Can you shred it and then add stock into the mix and shred the stock as well? <laughs> so, and of course, shredding in the first place. He knows why I'm laughing. <laughs> It's, it's shredded as it's around for a long time, it degrades. Adding a stock to it, when Health Canada says don't smoke it, we recommend you don't smoke it, smoking is bad for you, but we put in a bunch of stock to reduce the potency. Like, it makes no sense at all. It's <laughs> almost as if they want it to fail. Like, I don't know, right? But, but hey, Tribs, thanks for checking us out. You can always watch the rest of it later when you get so home. If they make these people, people get these contracts and they get told, oh, you gotta shred your butt and add a stock to it. Hopefully they won't do that, but people will freak out. If you invested millions of dollars in your grow operation to meet <laughs> Health Canada standards and they go, well, your marijuana is too strong, that's, that's going to be a problem. I'm not sure that's going to happen, but the guys in Flip who got that contract, they weren't told that was going to happen either. And then suddenly they got told, no, no, you got to shred your stuff and reduce the potency. Then you have to radiate it and freeze dry it, vacuum seal it. Then it's going to sit in our shelf for six months if somebody wants it. That person's going to order it. The first patients ordered it on credit. They would give it to the pot in advance. Patients would go, I don't want this, can I return it? No, 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 you can't return it, and you owe us money, where's our money? And actually, they've got a lot of patients that are getting collection agency calls from Health Canada, saying, we want our money for our marijuana that we sold to you, and they're like, I don't want it, it's crappy, no refunds, give us our cash, right, we're going to break your kneecap. So there's like this, this, it's kind of a ridiculous system, and now they're demanding everyone pay up front, right, which is, you know, you always be able to pay up front, but I mean, it's a bizarre, and the way they're doing it, they're saying the price is going to go up under the new system, and like, there's no reason for cannabis to cost 10 bucks a gram when it's legal, right? No reason at all. The world's best marijuana should not cost any more than the world's best tomatoes, the best oregano. It's the best product like anything else. They could sell it for three bucks a gram, which is, would be, you know, it's a huge price compared to any other thing. Everyone would be happy because the price is a lot less than it is now. They could still generate a lot of tax revenue out of that if they wanted to, but that's probably not how it's going to play out. But that's certainly the price of cannabis can and should go down a lot. And when it goes down a lot, then the black market disappears. People aren't going to bother growing their own. Some people might if they're connoisseurs, but the average person is not going to bother buying their own. If they can go growing their own, if they can buy it for like three to five dollars a gram and buy a wide range of extracts at reasonable prices, like no one's going to bother. It's not worth the effort. Right? And how much is it at your dispensaries? We charge more than that. We charge the lowest stuff I'd say is five bucks a gram. Most of it's around ten bucks a gram. And we charge ten dollars a gram straight up. Sounds like a high price, though I will say we reject the vast majority of marijuana that gets brought to us. People bring us cannabis all the time and we turn away easily 80-90% of it. So although you're paying ten bucks a gram, it's a real gram, it's not a 0.8 street gram or whatever, and <laughs> it'll be high quality medicinal grade product. You can pick from from many strains, but we do charge like, you know, the fairly high price, I guess, in that regard. And I wish we could charge less as well, like it's not, but that's that's how it works in terms of what we're paying for our cannabis, what you have to sell it for. But for a lot of people, they find using other products is actually better, and those are often much more affordable as well in terms of extracts and tinctures and those kind of things too. And if you're using a vaporizer also, you can really minimize the amount of cannabis that you use to get the same effect, so that's helpful for people. But we try to have a range. The five dollar stuff would be more typically outdoor or something like that. But even the cheaper stuff is always still like not. You know, we don't sell anything contaminated with any kind of mm, biological contaminants or mites or mildew or anything like that, right? So our stuff is all medicinal grade cannabis. Do you sell any other products uh, like oils or? We sell a wide range of stuff. We sell cookies, capsules, tinctures. I talked about the creams and lotions a while ago. They're quite incredible. Uh, we sell pretty much every kind of cannabis product that there is. The only thing we don't sell are live plants for juicing. And juicing cannabis is becoming a really hot kind of new trend right now. People often juice immature small plants. I've heard all different kinds of things. People juicing the leaves. Yeah. I've never tried it. I've seen talk about it. I think it's a wonderful idea. It's kind of hard to integrate into a dispensary having a bunch of live plants there. Kind of makes it challenging. But if someone could flash freeze some juice or make little things, but it's just a new thing. But it's, I think juicing is going to become quite popular, and it really also changes the paradigm of what marijuana medicine is. It's a plant you juice, 
and not just a joint you smoke. I'll, I'll, you ask another question, then I'll go to you. Yeah, and I like the idea of that, but I'm not in a position where I'd be able to get the raw cannabis. Well, absolutely. So would I be able to be for that? Yeah, no, a lot of people don't have access to that, right? But and I'll just before I, I'll just ask one thing about is that hemp cultivation has actually got a lot of medicinal aspect to it as well. And our paradigm of thinking that marijuana and hemp and what they are is actually not really that clear cut. And that what we call marijuana is cannabis that's high in THC, low in CBD, and it is grown with female plants grown on their own with the male plants removed out of the garden. That's marijuana. What we call hemp. It's typically cannabis strains that are low in THC and usually high in CBD. When you grow hemp for fiber, you grow tall hermaphrodite plants and you harvest before they go to flower. Not much medicine there, I'll get to you in a second. But when you grow hemp for seed, you grow mostly female plants, you grow them short, squat, big buds, big flowers, same but the marijuana style. You take out most of the male plants and you leave a few male plants behind. Those male plants seed the, fem the female hemp plants. And when they harvest that hemp for seed, they take the seeds out of the buds and all the buds get ground back up and put back into the field again. Well, those buds are rich in cannabinoids and especially in CBD. And CBD is actually better than THC for a lot of medical treatments. CBD shrinks tumors and destroys cancer cells better than THC does. And CBD also stops epileptic seizures. It has uh, reduced spasmodic effects for those kind of ailments as well. It's a, it's a better medicine in many ways than THC. Not for everything, but for a lot of stuff. Well, these farmers are growing, I mean, there may be a little bit less per plant because they're not, they're not being grown indoors under perfect conditions, but you've got 100 acres of it. There's a lot of medicine there that is being destroyed and put back in the field. If farmers can sell that for 10 bucks a pound, that would be a huge increase for them. That would be the cheapest, best CBD-based medicine I ever got. And we actually have people that are growing hemp medicine, like they're growing hemp strains, but they're growing them indoors marijuana style, growing female plants with big buds. So they can have high CBD strains, and those are becoming more popular for some people now. There's a girl who's one of the youngest medical marijuana users in Canada. She's got severe epilepsy. She lives in Prince George, and she'd probably be dead without marijuana medicine. And she really likes CBD strains. And they've created a strain kind of for her, which is really like a hemp strain grown marijuana style. And it's really incredible. So it's interesting that our, our perceptions of what hemp is, and what marijuana is, and what the medicine is actually are quite turned around and from what it really is in terms of the creams and lotions, in terms of hemp having amazing medical properties. And I'll take your question. Uh, you said earlier that voting was a part of being, voting is part of being, voting being, oh man, I'm stuttering here. Vote is to be part of a civilized society. And basically cannabis, the way you said, they're growing crappy cannabis, shredding it up with bark and giving that as medicine to patients. When everyone knows THC is the active ingredient, well, one of the main ones, Mm -hmm. CBDs, whatnot. That doesn't sound very civilized. And I'm scared and I'm worried about the privatization of cannabis and it becoming corporate and regulated to the point like tobacco is regulated. You can grow organic tobacco, it's better than chemical tobacco. And I just believe that everyone should have the right to grow cannabis. That, you know, you were here to decriminalize it and you're asking. You know, you are asking for a vote. I'm I'm not a voter, but I came here and still voted my time. And I'm thinking about you know signing my name, like lots of people to sign their name on credit card bills. It's not a big deal, and this is something I do believe in. But like I said, I am skeptical as far as what our government has planned for us, as far as cannabis as medicine. Well, I appreciate that skepticism, and it's certainly hard to have faith in a government that for so many years has persecuted cannabis people and pushed prohibition. Now we're going to let them make all the rules and make this happen, right? But we wrote this law ourselves. This isn't a law written by the government. And I would say that, that you can grow your own tobacco, but tobacco is intrinsically more difficult because you can't just pluck the leaf off and smoke it. You've got to go through a curing process to make tobacco usable. That's a bit kind of complicated for the average person, whereas cannabis plant Although it's a bit tricky to grow cannabis, and you can grow it outdoors. It's tricky to grow medical grade cannabis. It's not tricky to grow some bud. It's fairly easy to get the plant to do its own thing. All you have to do is harvest it, let it dry, and it's ready to go. It requires a lot less. It's a lot easier for someone to grow their own marijuana, I think, than to grow their own tobacco. 
And I firmly believe people have the right to grow cannabis. Actually, I would go further to grow any plant they choose yes. in their own garden. And I have been consistent on that for the last 20 years that I've been involved in this movement. I absolutely believe that what we call the war on drugs is really a war on the world's most culturally relevant and best, most useful plant species. And they're all wonderful ones. Although I focus on cannabis because that's the best one and also where we had the best chance of making some change. But, but I don't, I, 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 I would say that when we have this commission and figure out those details, I would like to be there and others will be there to make sure that we create a set of rules that enshrines the rights of people to grow their own cannabis, that enshrines the rights of patients to have access to affordable cannabis medicines, and that we create a system where adults can buy cannabis that's not from a monopolized, centralized kind of force, but from a broad range of smaller producers and that we have those kind of options available. That's the model I want to work for. But because we don't have the power as a province to go all that way, and we tried to create some kind of laws in our initial effort with, with Elections BC to create a regulatory scheme to ensure that everyone could grow a little bit of cannabis for themselves, but our lawyers and their lawyers agreed that that was not in the jurisdiction of the province. You can't create rules around illegal activity. All you really have is a line item veto. And so we could have told the police, not to do the same things, not investigate or search or do anything when it comes to cultivation of cannabis. But we couldn't set a limit, so it would mean that anybody could grow as much cannabis as they wanted. And I don't mind that necessarily, but that's not going to—that's not what we're going to go on our first referendum. People aren't going to go for that level, especially when other jurisdictions around us still have prohibition. I will say in Washington and Colorado, both states have allowed possession of cannabis, but one thing I much prefer about Colorado is they've enshrined the right to grow up to six plants. Mm -hmm. Six plants isn't that many, although I assure you they'll be learning how to grow the biggest star plant ever, right? <laughs> but, uh, but in Washington, they didn't allow that. Totally. Washington only allowed possession of cannabis. Although where you get it from, it doesn't matter. Once you've got it, you're allowed to possess it, whether it came from an underground grow up or, or the legal system they're going to put in place in one year. And I'm willing to bet the system in Washington is not going to be an ideal one in terms of having free access for everybody. But you know, there's like 52 American states, I think, or however many there are, I don't know. But uh, And so they're all going to do different stuff. And some of them are going to have really great programs, some are going to be too restrictive, some will be this, some will be that. But I think it's all a movement forward in terms of, of opening things up, right? But so I don't, I didn't do this for 20 years or whatever, and I'm not doing this campaign so we can hand marijuana over to Des Moines or to Monsanto. And I will fight against that as passionately as I'm fighting for this right now. Right? So this won't end our battle, but it will certainly make a big step in the right direction. And I do think that cannabis is harder to monopolize because of the fact that everybody's really growing it now already. And if the only government, if the only legal pod is Du Maurier's shredded, stock added, chemicalized, crappy stuff, it's not going to sell right People aren't going to want it. And maybe the odd person will buy it, but for the vast majority of people, they'll keep getting it the way they used to, right? So uh, There's all kinds of underground cigarettes that go around. I'm from the East Coast, and it's a big, big deal to buy illegal cigarettes. Super cheap. $10 a pack for cigarettes at the store, or you can get underground cigarettes for $5 a carton. Mm -hmm. And it's to the point where People will buy these, and now when you get pulled over by the police, they go through your ashtray to look for these specific butts, and you will get fined a specific price per butt. So people who smuggle these things, when they get caught with a trunk full of them, get fined so much per cigarette. So. <clears throat> Yeah, and maybe those kind of things will happen with cannabis. You know, it's hard to say. I would say it really depends on the tax rate, right? If the cigarettes, the more they tax cigarettes, the more popular smuggling underground ones becomes. Well, if they drop the tax on cigarettes significantly, probably that would become less interesting to people to buy underground ones. It would probably always be there, but at a lesser amount. Well, they just make laws so strict that it deters people from getting into those Absolutely. Kind of and I, you know, I, it's possible that in a legal cannabis system there will still exist an underground market or people who don't want to participate in the system or who want to grow it underground. It'll depend on how much the taxes are and everything else, whether that's worthwhile to somebody to grow underground marijuana. If the price has dropped from $2,000 a pound to 500 bucks a pound, it may not be worthwhile. But I'm not necessarily going to say that Changing the laws is going to make everything perfect and eliminate all the problems to do with cannabis or eliminate the whole underground market or anything, but it's going to be better than what it is now. It's going to be a big step in the right direction. And probably we'll have to tweak it over the years and probably the system we come up with right away 
will not be the same as what we have in five or ten years down the line, right? Because as other jurisdictions change the laws, as we get more comfortable as a society with legal marijuana, because we haven't had this before, and all of our lifetime has never been around, so no one really knows exactly what's going to happen, and a lot of people are quite nervous. When we look back in the future, we'll see that the harms of marijuana prohibition were immense. We will be able to see very clearly uh, from our perspective after marijuana is legalized, all the damage these laws have done to our society. But I think the first steps might not all be perfect, and some of them might be a little bit sideways and everything, but uh, yeah, I wouldn't say this is going to solve everything, or this is the final thing we have to do, and then we're all done. But I don't really see any other path to get from where we are now to some kind of legalized system in the next few years than going through this campaign. And I've been, I've been doing this a long time. People often said to me, oh, any, any day now, any year now, it's just going to be a few more years. And I've always thought, no. If it happens in my lifetime, I'll be happy. If I can see with my own eyes at least some of these laws changing, I'll be happy. But I really feel now that we have a chance to make this happen over the next couple of years through this campaign to get the ball rolling. And like I said, the commission and the rules we come up with may not be perfect ones, maybe some problems. Hopefully they're better than what we have now. And hopefully it's, I think it's easier to fix the rules once you've got something in place, once you've moved past that barrier of prohibition into some kind of legalized thing, we've got to keep the pressure on. But I think it'll be easier then to make a system that really works and to make sure it's not all, all done in a bad way or creating something that we don't want to see. But that's going to take the same kind of effort and dedication to, <coughs> to keep pushing this forward that we've done so far, absolutely. Dana, did you say there was a dispensary in Victoria? There's two that have been operating a long time in Victoria, and I believe there's two more that have opened up fairly recently, at least on the southern coast area. Um, I'm not quite familiar with those two new ones, but yeah, there's two. There's one called the Vancouver Island Compassion Society that was founded by Philippe Lucas, who was a city councillor in Victoria for a while. He's not owning it anymore, but they're operating. And also a fellow named Ted Smith runs one as well. And uh, his is a bit more of an underground kind of style, but he's also like been around a long time and helps a lot of patients. And um, those are the two biggest ones in Victoria. Okay, so if I wanted to start my own dispensary, what, mm -hmm. like I've been reading about this Green Line Academy in Kelowna. Don't, don't go to there. Don't go there? No. I do not I believe that they are providing the value for their money. That they charge quite a bit for their course. And I think it's misleading the information they give out to people because they're trying to talk, tell you you can make a lot of money within the legal system. First of all, their thing is kind of uh, defunct now because the rules have changed. But they were telling people, like the big problem with the Health Canada growing system is you can only grow for two patients at a time. And it used to be you could only grow for one patient at a time. That was the first rule when they put the rules in place. We went to court and fought that and the judge said, you're right, that's a dumb rule. That's unconstitutional. I'm going to strike that out. The government said, okay, you can grow for two patients at a time. Come back and fight us on that if you want. So it's really hard to make money selling plant medicines to two sick people. You can't make a living providing medicine to two people. The only way to make the money off of that is to grow some extra plants and then sell it to a dispensary or sell it on the black market. And when you get your Health Canada permit, you get told you can grow X number of plants and you can possess X number of grams at the end of the, in your possession. And if you grow big plants, it's not hard to get more medicine than you're supposed to have at the end. Health Canada says, if you have extra marijuana, you must dispose of it. They don't really specify what that means. People think, well, I'll dispose of it by selling it to the dispensary, right? I disposed of it. It's not really what they need, but ultimately it's helping somebody get a bit of extra money. It's not really hurting anybody, but they're certainly gaming the system. That's not how it's supposed to work. If they had just taken that rule out, if they made it the opposite, if they said you can only grow for 20 patients at a time minimum, then you wouldn't need all this system because people who were good growers would not grow in their homes, they'd grow in industrial areas, they'd grow outdoors, they'd be growing thousands of plants, it'd be easier to keep track of those people because they'd be doing it on a big scale, and you could make a living growing marijuana for 100 people or 500 people at a time. And if you were good at it, people would come to you and the price would drop because you'd be growing it in a big way in the economy of scale. They should have done that. They should have, most patients they would eliminate a lot of home growing without having to ban it just because no one would want to really do it that much. So it would get cannabis out of people's basements. It would have centralized it in bigger producers. And people would still have the freedom to go where they wanted to to find someone rather than being limited. You know, it would be a more free market kind of thing. I thought the conservatives liked that kind of free market kind of stuff. But that's how they should have done the system. And by limiting how many, people you can, how many folks you can grow for as a grower, that really like, just made it impossible to make a living doing that. And anybody who's good and reputable, well, they find their two patients like that, and then they're done, and they can't do anybody else. And so patients are constantly struggling. I know so many patients that have been ripped off or had somebody promise them certain things or made some kind of weird deal, and the person just takes it off. And 
it takes them six months to get Health Canada to change the license, or to, you know, so they get in a very difficult situation. And it's really the fault of the way they created the system. It really lends itself to that kind of cheating and, and, and miscommunication and those kind of problems. So creating a dispensary here, I would say, Good luck, and I would certainly be talking about that, but it really is difficult, I'll tell you. If, you, if, you, if your city council, or your neighbors, or your landlord don't like you, you're definitely going to get away. But even if all those things are in place, and the city council, and your neighbors, and your landlord are all happy about you, you might still get away it anyways. But that definitely helps. You know, so I said in Maple Ridge, the folks there, we didn't, we didn't tell the city council, we just opened. I'm on the board of directors, but I'm not a an investor or an employee or anything, right? But we opened up there without telling anybody. There was a big kerfuffle when we opened and those things in the newspaper, people were complaining and we want everybody over. We met with the mayor afterwards and nothing's happened. It's been several years and about three years or so and they've been fine. In Burnaby, we went and met with Derek Corrigan. He's a nice guy, he's the mayor of Burnaby. He also says marijuana prohibition's a failure. He's not a prohibitionist. He was like, yeah, sounds good, all right, good luck to you. One of the city councilors was like, what took you so long? Yeah, you'll be fine. We're there for three months, all the neighbors are from right across the metro town, the police came in, raided them all, shut it down, they're all facing charges next year. So I don't really, there's no magic formula, there's a formula to, to guarantee, that'll guarantee you getting busted, but even if you do everything right, it really depends on your local RCMP ultimately how they feel. And, uh, and so there's also ways of opening a dispensary without just getting a storefront and sitting there with a bunch of cannabis. You can do a delivery service where maybe you have a location where you process new memberships, but you don't keep your cannabis there, you deliver it to people in some way. So it just makes it a little harder for the police to deal with that. If you've got somebody who's got their own exemption who's allowed to possess cannabis and they're your delivery person, then it makes it even harder for the police. They're still not allowed to traffic, but it makes it very difficult for them to, to prove what's going on and to go after you. And if it's more, you know, the more challenging it is for them, the less likely they are to bother. But if you're sitting there at your store, here I am with all my marijuana and my sign, come get me. Like, it's, it, you know, if they want to do it, they will, right? So. It, it really varies, and I can't, I encourage you to do that, but I cannot guarantee that you won't end up getting charged. I would say that even if you did get raided, you're unlikely to get any serious jail time. The costs are more financial and personal and time consuming and those kind of things, but you're not going to go to prison for any length of time are right now anyways for opening the dispensary. Are you protected? Like, I've got my medicinal license. I don't have a license, though. And, uh, you know, it's with the changes to the laws with Stephen Harper, uh, you know, it's sort of up in the air, but it, like I have my medicinal license, but say if I opened up my own dispensary when I moved to the island, then if I, if they want to raid me and I'm more or less protected because I have my own. Do you know the traffic, right? Trafficking yeah. is not covered by that. You can't. So it'd be better to start possession. a compassionate club then. Well, it's the same thing, really. Same it, it's basically the same thing, just different wording. I mean, we called ourselves a dispensary because we already was a compassionate club. I don't want people to think that we were the same organization to confuse anybody. They used to call them all compassion clubs. I came out of California when they were starting because people were dying and sick from AIDS. So we're saying we have compassion for these people. Let's create it. The word compassion club really comes out of the AIDS crisis and the marijuana being used for that in California. But dispensary is just a different term that a lot of places call themselves dispensaries now, but we're having exactly the same protocols as the BC Compassion Club Society. Like, we're very similar in how we operate. There's no real difference. Just a different word for the same kind of business. And pharmacy dispensary? Yeah, exactly. Pharmacy would have for something. Yeah. Does your dispensary uh, issue uh, hashish at all? Yeah, we have all kinds of extracts, hashish, bubble hash, kitchen powder, you know, all that kind of stuff. Every cannabis product that exists, I think we pretty much care about. What about screening of medicine at your club? How do we screen them? Yeah. We use a uh, microscope that's hooked up to our computer, and that gives you a lot of information in terms of finding contaminants. If it gets through that first stage, which most of it doesn't, then we roll up a little bit, we'll try it out, taste the count, taste it, and see how that effect works, and how, uh, how it tastes, and if there's you can taste things like if it's overly chemicalized or whatnot. We also rely on feedback from our members, because even if you're analyzing some of it, if you're buying 10 pounds, it's hard to analyze every single little bit of all, but we try to. We run through some of it. What's that? Do you do anything for pesticides? Well, we talk to our growers. We run some stuff through uh, spectrograph analysis, but we don't really do that for most of our medicine. It's kind of cost prohibitive right now, but we're moving towards that. And that's becoming, I think, maybe the next kind of thing for dispensaries will be doing that, that kind of gas chromatography analysis and those, those kind of things. But uh, we do everything we can to screen it. I wouldn't say it's absolutely perfect, but I would say that we reject the vast majority of what gets offered, and that I think we offer a pretty consistently medical-grade product. But 
That being said, you know, it's, it's difficult into the current industry to absolutely ensure all those kind of things on Canada, so we do the best we can. What's your uh, club stance on BHO type products? We don't sell any butane extracts. Good. Um, we don't sell a lot of those kind of extracts. We sell butter, which is an isopropyl extract, okay. and we sell a like distilled oil extract and ground vials. Those are the only real extracts like that we sell. And I know too many people that have burned or blown up buildings or caused irreparable damage to themselves making butane extracts. And also, they're not really medical grade because there's often things missing. So no, I don't. You know, in a legal system, if they were made cleanly in a lab or whatever, then I guess that's okay. But we don't we don't provide those things. I don't I don't think those are appropriate products. Really. Well, are you familiar with the Rick Simpson story? I am very familiar with that, yeah. So why is he hiding in Europe? He was making the hemp oil. It's he was. I'm not a big fan of his recipe specifically. I think the way he makes it is kind of dirty or whatever. But at the same time, he's advanced the debate around cannabis and cancer treatment immensely and been a real promoter for that cause. They charged him because he was giving away stuff to people. They charged him with trafficking. I believe he was, he was in Europe at the away. time or was heading there and he went to Europe. They told him they dropped the charges. He said, I don't believe you, I'm not coming back. <laughs> so as far as I know, he's still in Europe. But they said they dropped the charges. I don't really know how that works. You stay away long enough and the charges go away. That's never happened to anybody oh, else. Depends. So maybe it was a trick, I don't know. Or maybe they just decided persecuting a guy who's giving marijuana medicine to sick people with cancer isn't really the best way to spend their money. But because he, he didn't get a lot of media and public sympathy, right? But, but but he's still he's in Europe. It away. That's still trafficking. That's still trafficking. Money doesn't have to be involved in traffic. Me passing a joint to someone wow. else is trafficking and marketed 60 I didn't days. I did even know that. Passing in prison for trafficking in marijuana by passing a joint. It doesn't usually happen, but it certainly can. And especially if you're a high-profile person and they want to get you, passing a joint is trafficking. Absolutely. Oh, and, and that the people do often in those circumstances, people do get charged with that kind of stuff. That's not coming to play. Do you have categories for what you uh, what you uh, sell? Yeah, most of our products are organic, but not necessarily all of it. And also organic is a term which is somewhat amorphous in its meaning, right? But uh, but we do, well, I mean, people say, well, you can't grow hydroponically organic, right? But if using organic nutrients. So we try to and we try to give as much information to our patients as well so they know about what they're getting and where it came from and what the story is. Not everything is necessarily grown organically, but it's all clean, medical-grade product, I would say. And we try to identify it and give our members as much information as possible so they can make an informed choice about what they're buying. But, but are all your products, uh, do you get all your products like that, or do you actually have categories uh, like set aside, you know, this year? Uh, we buy what people bring us. We don't have any specific categories <coughs> for our pleasure. We bring us medicine all the time. We have some that we have long-term relationships with, so people have their own kind of brand name, there'll be four or five strains with their sort of, you know, name in it. People know it's from the same company. But it really varies from a lot of people, and different dispensaries do different ways. The BC Compassion Society, I believe, has contracts with all their growers and actually has one-to-one -one relationships and only buys off a limited number of people. That's got advantages in some ways, because they have probably better control over their medicine. This, the disadvantage is they can't offer the wide range of strains that we can. I think we offer probably more cannabis varieties than almost any other dispensary that I know of. And that's the disadvantages and disadvantages of that too, right? So, but so I would love it if we had a system where our growers are all regulated and everything was done. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. And we are getting late. If people want to go. I'm not even sure what time it is. I think you might want to leave. So definitely feel free to head out. If you want to stay and chat some more, we can talk more personally afterwards. But I think that's it for the evening. But please sign up on here. Grab some extra flyers. Give them to your friends and family. Thank you. Well, that's pretty interesting. I got viewers being like, they busted Rick Simpson's place while he was out of the country, and somewhere, somehow, they found a weapon that had been never been there for as long as he lived there or whatever, so that's why he doesn't want to come back, because they've been fucking with his shit. <laughs> I wouldn't come back either. I wouldn't come back either. I'd be like, no. So, yeah, I've been streaming the whole time. It's over now. <laughs> um, uh, weapon laws have no end date. Right, okay, I get it. Cool. Well, thanks for that little tidbit. Um, it looks like this is wrapping up, and Dana's probably going to chat up a couple people, and he's got some buttons and some thingamajiggy bobs, and uh, 
yeah so thank you everyone for tuning in and if you missed the beginning or part way through or whatever you can check the archive um, afterwards and as always political fail blog and myself are totally crowdfunded so if you like what you see you can hit the donate button at the bottom of the Ustream page and thank you guys all for watching.